Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michelle Rosado, and I work at the Connecticut State Department of Education in the Performance Office. I want to welcome you all to today's webinar in the C CSTE's series of Learning at a Distance. This webinar series is showcasing how Connecticut schools and districts have implemented teaching and learning virtually. On behalf of the CSCE, I want to thank you for attending this webinar and learning from your peers. Um, this is definitely new territory for all school districts, um, and we need to be able to, to lean on each other and learn from each other um, to see what's working for students as they learn virtually. The staff at the Connecticut State Department of Education is here to support you, and I hope that you're doing well and that you and your families continue to do well. Just a little bit of housekeeping about the webinar for um, those of you that are attending. Again, thank you, and thank you very much to our presenters. Um, all attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we do welcome questions um, for our presenters. This webinar is going to be divided up and there'll be time to ask questions of each group um, as they complete their section. Um, questions will be addressed, as I mentioned. Um, additionally, the session is being recorded and it will be posted to the CSCE's COVID-19 webpage. Uh, additionally, you'll notice that there is a section called handouts in your web control, um, and that is where you will um, find the copies of the slides for our three teams that are presenting. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ajit Gopula Christensen, um, Chief Performance Officer, to do the introductions of our groups today. Ajit. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking time to uh, join this webinar. Uh, the three districts uh, who will share their journeys with respect to distance learning um, are uh, Danbury Public Schools, Waterford Public Schools, and Meriden Public Schools in that order. I personally wanted to thank uh, Sal, Tom, and Mark, and their amazing staff who uh, during this crisis have not only uh, supported their districts and, and truly changed their practice, but have also taken the time to share their stories and experiences with us. So I really, really want to uh, say a huge thank you uh, to them uh, for making this uh, time and putting this uh, presentation together. Uh, as Michelle uh, mentioned, there is a, a Q&A feature here. So there is a, uh, on your controls, you can type in your questions. So as uh, these districts are presenting, uh, please do uh, type in your questions. We encourage you to ask questions and keep this interactive. Uh, each uh, district will present for about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then there will be a pause where we will take questions. So I really encourage you to use the questions box. I will be monitoring that, and uh, at the end of their presentation, we'll be posing those questions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it to Sal Pascarella, Superintendent of Danbury Public Schools. Sal? Gee, thank, thank you for the opportunity to do this. I'm really um, happy to be able to have my team here. Um, to really go through the nuts and bolts of what we've done. I mean, our journey uh, started uh, about, I think, the 11th of March on a Thursday. Um, we, didn't ex we didn't expect to be where we were on that day. We thought we'd have another day because we had the information that we were going to be able to, um, to dismiss school because of the virus, but we didn't make it to the, to the day where we were going to prepare students. So we had an added, added challenge uh, going through this. So what we're going to do today just briefly talk about what we had to do and to let you know a little bit about Danbury. Uh, we're, we're, we're the gateway to Connecticut there right on the border. We have around 12,000 students. We have um, around 31% are white, 69% uh, of students are Hispanic and Portuguese black uh, is our general makeup. We have uh, our, um, our uh, free and reduce is around 52%. But uh, we have direct service of, um, of, of, um, of all but two of our schools. We have 13 elementary. We have um, three uh, middle schools, roughly about 1,000 each. Our magnet middle has about 600. We have uh, the largest high school in the state with about 3,300 students. 
Um, we also have an alternative school about 110 students and um, an off-campus um, suspension area for um, um, students that have been expelled. Um, with, with that said, um, the, the challenge we had was connectivity. We had um, an issue with a um, number of uh, units that we were going to be able to utilize for the online learning. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just to let you know that um, we were in a position to um, check our um, connectivity, the number of um, units that we had for students um, before we started. And we had to take a step back. If you look at our, one of the things we learned that um, it changes every day. Organizationally, the cabinet meets uh, twice a day because usually we make a decision in the morning and we're changing them in the afternoon. And I don't have to tell any of you, uh, you know how all of it changes from um, um, who can come into buildings, um, what kind of online learning is going on and not going on um, to um, a lot of other emergencies. So uh, we um, had to start up a little bit about um, where are we to take an accounting of where we're at. But more importantly, if you look at our information, we, we had to attend to the, to the like we call the Maslow needs. We had many students with um, parents out of work, um, inability to um, have um, a free and reduced lunch. We had to discover ways to deliver food. We had to discover ways how to do it safely. Uh, we had to figure out ways to um, connect students. When we started, we had approximately about 50% of our students connected. We are now up to approximately um, 95, 97%, which has taken a yeoman effort on everyone's part to get there. And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about um, you know how we came around this. But the message I want to make here, the, the learning for me has been, um, um, how do we not concerned about restructuring uh, the school day in a in a, uh, a non brick and mortar setting? We walked away from that, and that's a, that's I think part of our success. Not to try to replicate the day. And also, we spent a lot of time in creating uh, relationships and training of teachers. Um, so we basically started with um, um, synchronous, uh, asynchronous working um, packets that we've handed out, some on, some uh, curating of material on site, and then we trained teachers, and then we moved into the asynchronous work that we, we're doing now. It's iterative because we're learning every day and developing. And uh, with me, the people that are going to talk about it, I have um, our director of curriculum, Dr. Kismero. I have um, uh, the other area and challenge we're all facing, right? Um, we have 27% of our students that are ELL, about 13% uh, of our students in special ed. So we have our uh, director of pupil services here, Kelly Trukas, who will be talking about um, the special ed, and particularly, and Carol will talk about some of the ELL demands. Um, the other part of it was, um, you know, feedback. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the data and what is actually happening day by day. And our Director of Research, Kara Wands, is with us, along with our Director of Technology, Gina Chasman, which really made all of this, created the bloodline and the connectivity to make it happen. Kara, uh, why don't we move right into your presentation? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Sal. Um, so Danbury really saw um, this this rollout, which really should have been, uh, you know, a two to three year rollout, <laughs> move to distance learning or hybrid learning into a two to three week period. So um, not dissimilar from what many of the other districts that are listening in are have experienced it, um, you know, doing this uh, over the course of a couple of weeks uh, with a lot of requisite pieces missing and coming up with the best way to obtain sort of lift off. Um, while still attending to the needs of our families. So we broke the this kind of the liftoff implementation into four phases, that being to increase the capacity for the teachers, students, and families to connect in this environment, which was quite a hurdle, um, increasing teacher and administrative capacity to navigate in this new environment, and then giving them some tools and some training to support that, um, how, you know, figuring ways to provide ongoing digital support, 
um, to all the stakeholders, and we did we did some creative um, internal structures, which we'll talk about a little bit further in the presentation. And then how do we provide some scaffolds for areas, uh, particularly K-5, and curriculum support for um, that level of our school district who really did not have a high degree of technological saturation um, and skill per se. And then um, how we are providing sort of ongoing timely service and to make sure that we are continuously learning from what it is that we're implementing so we can refine and improve our product. Next, please. Um, as Dr. South mentioned, um, you know, while all of this was going on, oh, I see the toilet paper showed up. Um, <laughs> while all of this was going on, we have, uh, Danbury has huge needs. And so a lot of our families suffer from uh, food insecurity. And so one of the very first things that we were mostly concerned about was making sure, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of need here, you know, that the psychological and safety needs of our families were met um, and that we were able to provide food. Um, we serve over about 2,000 meals um, every time our, our food uh, school lunch program distributes meals. We have food trucks coming to Danbury uh, constantly and, and we're you know, struggling to keep up with the demand right now. We're actually turning families away. So there's a you know, mini humanitarian crisis in the midst of all of this that, that seems to play out um, you know, beyond just the teaching and learning. And so that was one of our biggest priorities, making sure that our families and our students' needs are met. Um, and that, you know, we're continue to do that in the background of all of this. Next, please. Um, so phase one of the distance learning was to in quickly increase the capacity to connect. And I'm going to uh, turn it over for just a second to Gina Jasmine, who's our director of technology. Um, and she spent a tremendous amount of time and effort getting, uh, this was, this was a, a district-wide effort, but I'd like for her to just give you um, sort of a brief um, intro to where we were in terms of connectivity and sort of where we ended up. So Gina, if you wanna talk a little bit about that and if you want Michelle to open up any of the links, just please let her know she has that ready. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yes, Michelle, if you could please click on portal increase. So the first um, phase that we tried to um, tackle was um, getting our parents onto our por parent portal. We uh, did not have our elementary uh, families on our parent portal. We're, we're a power school um, district, and we felt like that would be the best way to for parents to update their contact information, uh, knowing that we would um, need to increase our email capacity and making phone calls and really connecting with the parents, um, that became our, our top priority. So um, we felt that parent engagement would equal student engagement. Prior to March 13th, which is um, when we started really forming this plan, we, we had less than 30% of our total um, families on the portal. And um, we sent home letters with instructions on how to create the portal. We posted instructional videos on our um, website in multiple languages on how to create your portal account. And then twice a week, we ran reports to determine who hadn't created an account. Based off those reports, uh, many, many, many volunteers called parents to encourage and insist them, assist them in creating the portal accounts uh, using interpreters if needed. So these weren't just teachers or principals, they were um, uh, any support staff, secretary, uh, assistants, uh, Anyone, anyone who volunteered, um, and then, and then we had an ongoing report running, uh, and uh, we just continued to call families. And even six weeks later, we're we're still doing that. And as a result of that, um, we have 92% of our families. Uh, we have working emails, and um, and 85% of uh, portal accounts up and, and running. And as we increased our communication to families, we wanted to do it in multiple ways. Um, we, we, like everybody else, are tired of receiving five robocalls a day. So we wanted to make sure we had other ways 
to communicate with families and we do that through email and posting on our website. So the message that we send to families is coming across in three different ways, which we felt like was important. Um, next, the um, requested devices. So we needed a way to um, get devices in the hands of students. And we did that by creating a request form, uh, again, in multiple languages. We put um, the form on each school website. Uh, we used the robocall system to uh, encourage parents to sign up. And um, each parent could go in, fill out a form, uh, request a device. And we tied the device distribution to our food sites. And um, we felt like parents could come and get their food and their device at the same time, and it would um, increase our capacity. Uh, technicians came in and they prepared the devices for pickup. And um, one of the very cool things that happened were families uh, would drive up. We, we created at each site, we created a way for families just to drive through the parking lot. We asked them to put a piece of paper in their um, windshield with their student's name. And um, we could actually check off their name before they got up to the actual distribution and it, and it made the system go a lot faster. Again, uh, this was all about volunteers. Uh, everyone at the site was a volunteer um, calling families to get encourage them to come pick up a device. And um, that continues to be the case. We're still handing out devices. We've fulfilled 93% of our requests um, that have uh, come in, and we still continue to hand out devices. And uh, again, the biggest uh, success to that is that we tied it to the food distribution. So, um, Gene, I'm gonna I'm gonna move through some of these other pieces. We're having some trouble with yep. the links, so okay. um, no problem. Yeah. I can't um, stress enough how how much work was involved, obviously, in in getting those devices out and then um, in making sure that our families can access. So some of the charts that we had to show you were really about our overall connectivity. Um, that was a number that dramatically increased over a couple of weeks through a lot of the work that Gina described. Um, and now we're at the point where we have around 90% of our teachers are, per, are reporting that we have at least 90% of their rostered kids connected. And where we struggle a little bit, um, is around in some of our challenges are around um, our language barriers. So where we see that students are not connected typically in some of our ESL bilingual classes where sometimes we only have 50 or 60 percent of our kids connected and then those kids are, are you know are, are also not connecting in some of their other classes. So we continue to um, to struggle with that but we also have a lot of staff who are working on it and so our numbers the connectivity um, numbers are going up every day. So Right now we have a nice a nice degree of saturation, but we're still continuing to work. Um, and we're also constantly- yeah, as an operational, as an operational thing, just so, you know, nuts and bolts, our, our support staff, you might want to talk a little bit about what their outreach is in order to get that done, might be important for people to hear. Which, which staff are you referring to? The secretary and the-, the Oh, uh, right, the absolutely, so, absolutely. So one of the ways that we, you know, deployed the secretaries, um, and we had some folks who also work in our family learning center and, and after school programs who are multilingual. Um, we would give them rosters of families who were not connected or who were not in the system. And all day long for hours and hours at a time, they, as Gina said, they made those phone calls to connect parents. We had our staff members create videos in multiple languages on how to connect to um, our, our, you know, um, our systems and also to how to get into Google Classroom, which we'll talk a little bit about um, moving forward. Um, so again, we did have some issues with folks understanding how to connect to our platform. So we picked, they picked up a laptop, they get home and they're like, well, now what do I do with it? So we, we definitely had spent a lot of time on the phone walking families and individuals through connecting and we're still working on that. Next slide, slide please. So in phase two, it was really how do you build the teacher capacity and the administrative capacity to navigate in the digital environment. Um, this is a part that we really wanted to get right. Um, from the start, we took an extra week to do some vision building and to make sure that all of our roles were clarified. And by vision building, you know, even though it was an emergency situation or in the middle of a pandemic, um, if 
when it looks right, when distance learning looks right, what does it look like? What are those attributes and characteristics um, that define high quality teaching and learning in a digital environment? And we wanted to make sure that if we were convert, if we were moving in this direction, that even if it took us a little bit longer, that we were not just trying to retrofit um, technology and meaning uh, doing exactly what we were doing before, but you know, digitizing it somehow but really reconfiguring and transforming the, the learning environment and spending our time that when we spoke of distance learning and that we could maintain that vision, even though we were far from it, um, but working towards that vision so that if this were to continue, um, we, you know, we saw this really as a the silver lining and the dark cloud of how do we shift and um, you know, disruptive sort of innovation how do we shift our district over to this and do it the right way and set the, the foundation from the beginning, recognizing that we have, still have a long way to go. Um, we also made very um, strong assertions that staff needed to build, rebuild their relationships that they had in the classroom in a distance environment. And that meant you know, student um, connectedness, teacher to student connectedness and student to student connectedness. So rebuilding the community that they had in their classroom in a digital environment. Um, and that interaction was everything and that uh, ways, any ways that we can get the kids to interact both with teachers and with them, with their own peers um, would bode well for us and, and uh, you know, lend itself to this high quality vision that we described. Um, we also redeployed some of our, uh, some of our coaches and I'll talk a little bit about grade level banding and our Google Classroom as that we created um, for the whole district. Uh, in another slide, but that was a key piece to building sort of a scaffold uh, for our K-5 folks. We also did a lot of Google Classroom training, IXL, Learning A to Z, and RAS Kids. We brought some programs online, making sure that our ESL students were supported and that we had some core platforms for practice offline. Um, and then focusing our, you know, changing some of our uh, our pacing, look, re-looking at our pacing from, you know, the time that we were disrupted to the end of the year and really keying in on those high leverage standards and then building lessons around those common lessons. Um, again, we had some issues though with, you know, in this environment, synchronous and asynchronous, how do you maintain confidentiality for, especially for our special education students? How do we deliver mandated services? How do we get kids, especially the younger ones to submit work? We're still struggling with that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, what were we? What what do we do with students who are kind of in a tiered intervention in SRBI? So we're in the process of re uh, redefining what that looks like in Danbury in a digital environment. Next slide, please. Michelle, can you advance? Thank you. Um, and then, how do we continue to provide digital support? And so, so outside of this vision, you know, digitally, how do we get teachers who may not have had a lot of digital uh, skill sets to kind of shore those things up very quickly? And what could we do? And again, the scaffold for K-5. So we did have, uh, we surveyed our, our users. We had 131 teachers in the district who identified themselves as super users or Google geniuses. Those are folks that either already had a Google Classroom or normally use Google tools on a regular basis and felt that they would be willing and are capable of training their peers. And so every Tuesday, we have about six or seven super users uh, do, um, do live webinars for their peers. And so any one of our folks can access those for additional 30 minute sessions. So each Tuesday that's available. And we have hundreds and hundreds of teachers who've been accessing those um, so much that we've been had to close out the sessions. Uh, and then we record those and post those later for those who can't make it. Um, we employed a distance learning transition team and that we had so four of our most proficient administrators um, who felt very comfortable in operationalizing some of this, uh, assisted me with kind of the thinking behind the planning K-12, how to best utilize the super users and how to deploy support strategically. Um, we have those, two, the, obviously the, the workshops and then the K-5 Google Classroom, this was really important. So at K-5, we took our, all of our coaches and we assigned them to grade levels. And they are literally developing uh, lessons in numeracy, literacy and science and our special areas uh, with our special, er special areas team to put out weekly lessons, weekly common lessons. And so these are our folks that are doing, you know, screencastifies, they are um, doing some modeling, they are doing, they're developing lessons um, at least three or four a week that the teachers can use that are common 
to kind of get them off the ground. And as the teacher's proficiency at the K-5 level is building in this environment, um, they're, you know, they're transitioning over. But for now, we were able to make sure that we have those supports in place. And that has been great with providing sort of consistent expectations across across the district at the K-5. 612 is operating pretty independently with this. And um, they were they were rather skilled and, and a lot of folks had Google Classroom. So, but doing that support at K-5 really made a huge difference. And it also changed the way we're, we're seeing how we use our coaches because the grade level banding has been very powerful with building expertise at a grade level with standards. Um, we've been providing parent and teacher tutorials, live webinars, recorded sessions. Um, some of the feedback we're getting is, whoa, we've got a lot of information here coming. How do we, um, how do we kind of uh, streamline the flow of information? So we've made some great changes in that, in that direction as well. Next slide, please. Um, just very quickly, we'll advance. This is just sort of a little uh, visual. Looks like some of the numbers got cut off there. Um, but the, the basically the um, kind of, you know, not forgetting where our teacher's comfort level is so that we can kind of continue to retool um, what we're offering and their level of comfort. And so overall, we have about 85% of our teachers are feeling pretty comfort, comfortable. Some, of course, are feel like they're absolutely rocking the new environment um, and others, you know, a much smaller number that feel like they still needed some additional support. And we continue to reach out and pair them up with super users as well as provide more PD in the areas that they've identified feeling not so confident in. Next slide, thank you. Um, and then how do we provide ongoing support? This is the piece about continuous improvement. So we redefined our virtual systems and structures, meeting structures look differently, we redesigned our help desks. We have weekly departmental meetings, the K-5 classroom, consistent office hours and messaging. We survey, survey, survey all the time to use data to drive our decision-making. Um, Dr. Salary Friday um, cranks out a letter, a great letter of um, not just uh, information, but um, aspiration, um, as well as any updates that folks need. So our families have come to, to um, look forward to that Friday letter. And then of course, you know, how do we continue to, to, to stay on pace with this rapidly changing needs and meet our commitments and continue to uh, reach our ESL families? Next slide, please. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly Truchess to just talk quickly about the special education distance learning and some of the celebrations and challenges we've had there. Thank you, Kara. Um, so I see we are getting a time check to wrap up. So I will try to go through this quickly. And if there's questions, uh, please let me know. Um, one of the big things I think we did from the beginning um, is we worked together as a team. So everything that was done for both the special education and the um, ESL populations that have a unique set of needs was also considered in the context of the district plan. Um, and we also you know, didn't hold back while we were rolling this out. We knew it was, wasn't a perfect system from the start. Um, so we knew we'd hit some bumps along the road, but that didn't stop us. If we could meet the majority of our students um, by making a district level decision, we moved forward with that. And then my team and I worked through the individual logistics for smaller populations or subsets of our children. Um, one of the things early on that we decided to do is do a one-on-one -on -one Google Classroom for every single special special education student in the district. We have about a 14% identification rate, um, and that represents 1,700 students. So this was no um, easy uh, task to do, um, but we pulled it off very successfully. I think the structure in doing small group meetings with staff to roll it out, training, 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 um, providing extra voluntary training for those that felt that they needed an extra um, help with this um, really helped. We um, provided uh, different tools and tricks that they could do to make this a little bit more easy to manage um, and encouraged all of our special education teachers to keep one main, main Google Classroom page that they share colleagues on. So there's a, a sharing of resources and some of the staff in addition created um, shared Google Drives where they're sharing a wealth of different information regarding um, different learning strategies, online uh, tools that have helped them with their children. Um, the, uh, we are moving, uh, in the beginning, it was a voluntary um, to have staff. We strongly encourage staff to check in with kids. That was mandatory. They had to do it via phone. They had to do it via Google Hangout. It was their choice of how to do that. We set the bar during week one that one contact per service provider, so special ed or related service, um, each one of them had to make a contact with the family and child in particular at least one time a week to check in. And many of these go back to the, um, the social emotional needs, the um, food and security needs, uh, the housing situations, all of those had to be secured first before we moved 
move forward with instruction. Um, that the purpose of these conversations were to equip parents with the tools and strategies to help to support their kids as well. Um, and um, we are now moving into kind of the next phase where we're um, requiring the Google Hangouts. So we're currently rolling that out next week um, because we think so strongly that not just the information through Google uh, Classrooms, but also the check-ins, the virtual learning in small groups and one-on-one -on -one is, is paramount to, to moving our, our district forward. Um, uh, we we are still working on some of our challenges. One of the things that we have done is we've only allowed special ed and related services to meet with students um, for their IEPs in a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, so thinking through how can we begin with parent consent, of course, to start to do so in a small group to meet more students' needs at the same time and to start to um, get some additional peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction with the kids, which the kids are seeking. Um, how, how we have yet to resume PPTs um, virtually, and that was very intentional in allowing our staff to focus all of their attention on um, providing good instruction, connections with families, and getting all of our students engaged. Um, and so the next step will be moving into resuming our planning and placement team meetings. Um, of course, like other districts, we um, are still have concerns over compensatory education. While we are doing everything we can to meet kids in this environment, we know that that is a reality of the situation that we're in. Um, and lastly, trying to plan for uh, extended school year, um, which our district is um, moving in the making the plans for it to be in a virtual environment as well. Um, so those are just a brief overview of some of the things that we've done that has been very helpful. Michelle, I can wrap up very quickly from here. So this is just a, a you know, a, a, and we, again, we can share the PowerPoint with anyone uh, who would like it. Um, but just, you know, we have a lot of effort around making sure our English language learners are supported. We have our SIOP coaches working hard. We have a lot of videos and resources in multiple languages. We provided some lots of supports to to our staff and to our families to continue to sort of bridge the ESL barrier. We're still concerned, obviously, about online internet access and making sure that our our kids can submit and complete assignments, but we are working on some new things. Uh, our next you know, worry is that we're trying to figure out how to continue to test ESL students to prevent the backlog from opening up. And that's some of our challenges moving forward, think, even thinking about next year. Next slide, please. And next steps, you know, how are we monitoring the quality? That's really the next, uh, from the next few weeks, how are we going to conduct some virtual data rounds to check the quality of what's happening in the classrooms and to make sure that everyone's uh, um, you know, doing at least some of the non-negotiables, working on professional development. Um, we're, as McKelly said, we're still trying to plan for many of the same things that we would normally plan for and keep this sort of uh, ship in the air here, this uh, plane in the air. Uh, we're considering looping students at the lower level. Um, love to hear other districts and their thoughts on what they're doing to mitigate loss and uh, what they're doing for summer school. And as always, we continue to um, make sure that the basic needs of our families are met during this time period. And that's about it. Sorry for going Sorry, over. Just, uh, <laughs> just, just to end um, listening to this, just so that everyone knows, the um, our per pupil expenditure at 169 towns, we're first on the bottom. So we've had to do a lot of looking into reallocating resources, changing things around to do this. Our, uh, we roughly have approximately the 1,000 um, teachers or a central office is, is small. It's, we've done this on really on the backs of a lot of volunteers and some of the ingenuity and passion of uh, my team that I want to say thank you for. And again, Ajit, thank you for the opportunity. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for um, for presenting. It's overwhelming to even just hear your story. Um, a, a district the size of Danbury and um, uh, the vast numbers of English learners and, and the large high school population and so on. So it, it really is impressive what you've been able to pull out. One question I did have is, are you able to get a sense of how much uh, new learning is occurring through this uh, distance learning approach, uh, or is it is is do you feel that a lot more of the work is around maintaining and and refreshing what's been taught? Do you feel like new learning is happening? And if you feel that's happening, how do you how do you know that? Right. So it's a great question. Um, it's definitely a concern uh, that I have, and I know that my entire team has. You know, I think the 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 focus was really getting up and running and getting things moving. And uh, I, now that's where the monitoring Google Classroom comes in. That's the virtual, that's part of the virtual data rounding that I spoke about um, in the sense of what, 
what constitutes quality in this environment. So right now, you know, we have folks that are compliant, we have people that are posting, we have, you know, work that's going out, we know what that work looks like because we put a lot of that together ourselves. So we're confident in that regard. But then how do we get to this interactive piece where there's um, new learning happening, where students are co-constructing knowledge and all of the great things that we look for when we go into a classroom? And so that's, that is really part of the next step. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, as Kelly mentioned, we're going to be um, asking our folks to, to make sure that they are doing the synchronous part. We've made it optional uh, with, with, a, with a great deal of um, urgency behind it, but we feel that that is a very important part to making sure that there is new learning and that you are connecting with kids and that there are those aha moments and that you are able to leverage those conversations. So moving forward, I think that the connectivity piece, synchronous part will be, will be big. Um, and certainly there's been some amazing, um, you know, we put a challenge out to have our uh, administrators start to submit um, lessons and, and learning uh, activities that were really high quality that speak to new learning and speak to innovation. Um, and so we'll be looking for that and then putting those forward as models um, of how to get to the next step with this, get to the next level. You know, we have we have good, great new learning in pockets, but how do we scale it? Kara, I would just add too that um, ensuring that we had other platforms that assessed whether um, that were tied to standards. So using IXL and learning A to Z to ensure that there were adaptive pieces that were going on that we could continually assess students, look at analytics to say, okay, these many students have mastered new standards. This is how things are evolving kind of in a digital way um, in combining with the Google Classroom with yeah. the teacher directly. That's a great point. Yep, yeah, that is the primary reason why we brought those two and scaled those two programs in so that we could see where kids are in real time with, that, with, with the standards. Thank you for mentioning that, Kara. Well, thank you, Danbury. Thank you so much. I know we're we're up on time here, so uh, Michelle's gonna move us along to the next uh, district, Waterford, and uh, Tom and team. Uh, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Giard, superintendent of the Waterford Public Schools, and want to thank everybody for making the time. We're we're fortunate to live in a small state where collaboration really can happen uh, across the state, and today is just uh, one more example of that. Uh, our team is honored and excited to be presenting, and I want to thank our entire Waterford team, not just those presenting, but all of those at home delivering quality instruction. Uh, a, a thank you in that I'm really proud of them for successfully launching what we've been able to launch so far. I have a representative sample of folks presenting with me today, including Craig Powers, our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, our middle school team of principal Jim Sachs and numeracy coach Rob Salino. You may recognize those names from the latest issue of Performance Matters for our mathematics growth and an elementary team of Joe Macrino, uh, an elementary principal at Aswagachi, and Jennifer Jacobson, another numeracy coach. Uh, the title of our presentation is Maintaining Rigor and Engagement in Uncertain Times, which has really uh, been a focus of ours. We've seen very strong gains in recent years uh, across the district, and we didn't want that work and that momentum to go away just because we were delivering instruction in a remote environment. A little background about our district. We're much smaller than say a Danbury or Meriden. We are 2,500 students across five schools and an 18 to 21 year old transition program. We have approximately 250 teachers, 450 total staff. We're about 30% free and reduced lunch, 19% special ed, and our EL population has doubled in the last uh, four years to give you a little bit of uh, background about our district. Oh, I went too fast. Uh, one of the things I might have taken uh, for granted a bit before this is the investment we've made in Waterford in developing our teacher leaders. Our teacher leaders, such as Rob Salino and Jen Jacobson, who, who will be presenting today, have been instrumental in our distance learning plan. Uh, Craig Powers, our assistant superintendent, has done a marvelous job, but we both firmly believe the important role of our teacher leaders ha have played in the design, launch, and implementation. And our distance learning plan is uh, our foundational document and continues to guide us. It's available in your handout section. Keys to, key to our success was not necessarily rushing to launch. We had immense local pressure to launch really fast uh, because surrounding districts were launching really fast. 
uh, but we felt we needed to take some very deliberate steps up front uh, to have a solid foundation, which is really the first part of our presentation. Uh, important focus for us was not only ensuring high quality teaching and learning, but we wanted to make sure we were going to be able to continue our district's work. Uh, we have some great initiatives going on, and you'll hear a little bit about that today and how we're continuing those things, even in a distance learning environment. Now I'm going to hand it off to our assistant superintendent, Craig Powers. Thank you, Tom. Distance learning would not be possible without a team. We are fortunate to have an excellent team of instructional coaches, teachers, leaders, along with a fantastic admin team, which afforded us to be successful at scale in distance learning. Kudos to our technology instructional coaches who built online trainings to ensure the faculty would be successful in distance learning. This included my first Zoom meeting with 45 participants, admin, teacher leaders, uh, and instructional coaches. It, uh, the tech coaches would uh, be part of this training if they weren't uh, rolling out uh, uh, all the training this week and last week to our paras to support distance learning um, uh, training too. Uh, you'll hear about, you'll hear later from our literacy and math instructional coaches who supported all the teachers with curriculum compacting. I must first give credit to this design to a colleague of mine in Madison, Assistant Superintendent Attendant, uh, Gail Darlin Hench, uh, for sharing this resource uh, with our region. After my online meeting with all the teacher leaders, uh, then they held similar meetings with their departments. They shared all the professional learning resources, as well as the design and expectations uh, set by the district for distance learning. This was further supported with our admin in remote faculty meetings, and then being part of each online uh, classroom via Seesaw or Google Classroom to ensure a consistent and rigorous rigorous instructional continuity. Thank you. I guess that's us now, Rob. Um, this is Jennifer Jacobson. I am the numeracy coach at the elementary school level. Um, at the primary level, we met as grade levels to discuss the standards that still needed to be taught this school year. And while discussing these standards, we had conversations regarding where a particular standard fell within the clusters. Was it a major supporting or additional cluster? Um, knowing that we should be focusing on the major clusters during this time of year, there was still that hope that maybe we would be- I can't hear you. You can't hear me? I can hear you, Jen. This is Tom. Hi. Hmm. I can hear you. This is Mark Benigni. I can hear you, Jen. Okay. So should I just keep going? <laughs> keep going. Okay. I would keep going. Okay. Knowing that we should focus on the major clusters, there was still that hope, that twinkle of our eye that um, we would be, re would be returning to school and that the teachers would have plenty of time to cover those major clusters that hadn't been taught yet without confusing the parents and that idea of new teaching that they're all worried about. So we had decided to focus on supporting, to focus on the supporting and additional clusters that parents had background knowledge in so that they could focus more on getting comfortable with using the online learning platform of Seesaw at the primary level. Um, while most of our classrooms had introduced this platform to teachers as a way to share announcements, families had never used it to actually help their children complete assignments or to use utilize the tools that go along with Seesaw. So knowing this, we did stick with the more basic concepts and standards. Um, we used the curriculum compacting outline that Craig had mentioned before. The outline was set up with 12 weeks. Uh, we decided to focus on the first six weeks. Like I said, we were still hoping to be back at school and not have to worry about planning for the second six weeks at home. Um, which we are currently working on now. Um, and the outline was set up with uh, compacting criteria, priority lessons, evidence of learning, and possible next steps. And this was done for each of the weeks, for the first six weeks. Rob? All right. 
So thanks, Jen. So with grades four and five, our initial work focused on the standards that had been covered and uh, how the students had performed in those topics. It was important to know that the students felt comfortable in that, with that content in order for us to determine our next steps. So the feedback and the input from the teachers was essential in building that document. From there, we looked at the remaining standards and what we call those power standards were for each of those grade levels. And uh, we used some of the documents from Achieve the Core to kind of, kind of assist us to do that. I also thought it was important to incorporate those areas that we see in middle school as essential to success, such as fractions and multi-digit arithmetic with decimals. And then the teachers and I were able to prioritize accordingly. Once that work was completed, we were able to map out our scope and sequence. At the middle school, uh, we were fortunate in that having started the Illustrative Mathematics program last year, we were in need to do some compacting in order to cover that robust content of that program within the first year. So having to do some compacting to finish out this, our second year seemed a little bit less daunting. Last year, our administration had allowed us uh, some release time before each unit so that we could familiarize ourselves with the program and its scope and sequence. From that work last year, we knew the essential ideas remaining for this year and which lessons or activities really drove those ideas home. So we were able to tap into that work last year to give, uh, in order to compact our work from this year. And again, the teacher input made this work possible and gave credence to it. Jen? Uh, the staff is utilizing this outline to help them guide their instruction and planning of lessons. In Waterford, we have three different elementary schools, pre-K through five. Um, and the grade level teams at the primary level have split up the subjects so that each teacher became the expert for this subject area during distance learning. Um, this has helped them to really dig into more um, mini lessons that they're able to teach. Right now, we are not Zooming um, live lessons in Waterford for the primary grades. So our teachers are basically teaching their mini lessons on Screencastify and uploading them for parents and attaching them to Seesaw. Um, They're working with their coaches and other team members, grade level me members across the district to also help with this. Because of their daily discussions that they're having with each other, they are helping us decide whether we can move along in uh, following that outline or whether or not we need to slow down. Um, the difficulty we are having with certain standards is normally you would be able to see if your students are getting it or if some students need to continue with one strategy as opposed to moving on. And that's where we're having a lot of discussions is how quickly to move in an area that we know is a major standard or clustered um, for that grade. Our teachers have been unbelievable um, with this online learning. The they're creating parent tutorials so that they're not just mini lessons for teachers, I mean, for students, but they're also creating mini lessons for parents to watch along with written notifications also. So this way, if there's a parent who needs to visually see it, they can see it as well as a parent who needs a written explanation. Um, so they're really going above and beyond to try to help parents with the teaching. And they're not just attaching lessons that are already created, they are creating their own and is the students can actually see their teacher teaching it. So it's really building that communication between the students and trying to keep them into the schedule and routine that they're used to. Um, they're starting to also look at differentiating mini lessons and um, assigning them to individual students on Seesaw. Um, in Waterford, we use Dreambox, so they're able to see the students' progression on Dreambox, and then they can create a lesson just for that student based on their results in Dreambox. And for everybody out there, our curriculum compacting work uh, that uh, Madison shared with us is in our handout section under our distance learning plan. You good, Jen? Yep, thanks, Rob. Okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit how our middle school is incorporating that and along with some of the other uh, wonderful things that are going on at the middle school. So. Um, you know, how we're managing math, it's essential to note that, you know, the classroom teachers are the magic makers here. They really are. And they're the ones who bring all these plans to life. They make it meaningful and they make it engaging to the students. So their hard work is really the main reason for the success that we see. With our illustrative math, our teachers have been able to create screencasts of lessons and they're able to use the same content that the students have been using all along in class. 
So the IONT Illustrative has an online platform, so teachers and students are able to access that content with ease. Uh, and presently, you know, we're missing that collaboration component that is a big part of the IM program, but um, students for now are at least enjoying a similar presentation uh, that they were accustomed to here in class. Uh, knowing that distance learning is going to probably need to continue, our next level of work is going to include trying to allow for some level of collaboration between the students on an occasional basis. Uh, the IM program design calls for most of its direct teaching to come at the end of the lesson. And this is where teachers are able to screencast to their students. You know, some of the great things our teachers are doing is that they're holding daily office hours. Uh, they meet with their students face to face. And this allows for questions, clarification, uh, and even probably more importantly, it allows for that social emotional piece and connection that um, the teachers and our students have together. Uh, our teachers uh, create screencasts for individual students who are struggling with a typical topic. So um, we've had some teachers that will create a screencast and assign it to one particular student so they can go back and revisit it and answering the specific questions that that student has. Uh, we also have some teachers who are sending personal emails to all students that they see. So, you know, maybe 100 or so. And they're providing feedback along with words of encouragement. This has been a huge undertaking for those teachers, but it's also paid off with huge benefits. Uh, on the tech front, Khan Academy, which partnered with IM last year, provides that daily practice of skills taught for the day after they've seen the lesson. It's a chance for them to go and practice those skills. It provides immediate feedback to the student, and it provides immediate useful data for the teacher. And this allows for unlimited redos and retakes, which is a school-wide initiative. And I believe Mr. Sachs is going to expand on that. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, yeah. so what I think uh, was really contributing to the success of our online program is we have been working on and still are working on standard-based grading. So we've had committees and a lot of professional development, and the teachers are already in a mindset of uh, understanding curriculum compacting, which worked really nicely when you have the seamless uh, interaction between Illustrated Math, Khan Academy, and Google Classroom. And we just this past fall had uh, instituted a redo retake policy, and very early on in the distant learning journey, we um, reiterated to teachers how important it was to let students go back redo, retake, ask questions, use their office hours. Uh, so those existing initiatives uh, really contributed nicely to, you know, comments from parents that this was going well and me viewing what was happening in various meets and classrooms. And it's, uh, it's been a really nice thing. So we sort of unwittingly created all the foundations that we, or most of the foundations we had needed for a solid distance learning, learning program. Uh, so that that was a very positive thing for us. Hey, uh, Waterfront team, I'm just gonna yep. poke in here. There are some questions coming in that are pertinent to what you're presenting, so I want to raise those now. Sure. Uh, uh, two questions have come in around connecting with students. So, how do teachers keep in touch with families, and what has the feedback been? And also, a disadvantage of distance learning is the lack of social interaction. How has Waterford connected with students and families during this distance time? So I could possibly have a part of that. Uh, this is Jim Sachs again, principal at the middle school. Uh, roughly half of our teachers went right on and uh, got involved in meets with their kids. So they're going on twice a day from uh, 10 to 11 and 1 to 2. And they invite all their students into meets to review, to do a Q&A, to reteach a little bit, and also to um, to explain an earlier you know video that a teacher had made to explain content. But they're also, uh, the teachers who aren't opting for that are using pre-recorded uh, videos. Their uh, office hours involve them being available for chatting and for emailing. And they're sending a lot of pre-recorded messages to students. So there's a lot of back and forth. And frankly, if every single teacher on Google Meet, I'm not sure a kid could manage it all. So it was kind of a nice balance that half are using and half aren't. Um, that, that's from a middle school perspective. I don't know if... Uh, Joe Macrino from the elementary school might want to add to this. Good afternoon. This is Joe Macrino. Um, I'm an elementary school principal at Oswagachi here in Waterford. And this week, after we had a couple weeks of experience under our belts, we um, unveiled live morning meeting type meetings with all students pre-K through five. So uh, we trained our staff. Uh, most of them are using Zoom or Google Meet, and the teacher will provide times during the day, sort of like office hours, where they'll hold social emotional based meetings uh, for students that are available. Uh, that is optional for the student, but we wanted to provide that because 
we recognize now that we do have a couple of weeks behind us and the weather is getting nicer, engagement might start to wane. So this is a wonderful way to maintain the rapport with the students that they had in the classroom, but also to maintain that engagement. So we have a schedule that's posted to a, a local drive. So our paras, specials teachers, special education can all see when grade level meetings happen and they're encouraged to hop on as, um, as well to maintain that educational community. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate that response. I do also have a couple of math questions. Sure. Sure. All subjects are so important, but math is based upon having a strong foundation from the previous year more than any other subject. What are you doing to assure students are ready to start their next progressive year in math? So that's kind of one question. And, and another question that's related to IM is with IM, do they use the Mr. Morgan videos as well? Those are very helpful. So really, how are they preparing uh, for getting ready to start the next year? Okay, um, this is again, Rob, the middle school math coach. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I believe that what we're doing is we're really looking at, even though we've compacted our curriculum, we're really looking at completing all the content for this year. So uh, we feel confident that um, we set a pacing guide earlier in the year and uh, the teachers have done a great job at trying to adhere to that, you know, to ensure that we could get through all the content. So, you know, as we went into this distance learning platform, uh, we realized we had, you know, maybe two and a half to three units left to cover. Um, and with that being said, knowing that we had this, this 12 week window to do it, we were able to, I think, condense all of the material that we really needed to get in there um, so that we will cover all of our content. So we, we feel confident about that. Uh, we, you know, we know it's not the best situation right now in terms of, you know, how the students are learning it and it's not going to work for every kid, but we're hoping if we can get, you know, 70, 80 percent of the kids up to speed and, uh, um, you know, ready to move on next year in, in a really good spot, then we know we'll have to go back and probably fill in some gaps next year. But we'll be prepared to do that when the time comes. Great. Thank you. And. Uh, the so video continue and uh, uh, maybe about five more minutes if we can wrap it up. Sure. Yeah, I was going to do this next slide, but uh, Dan Barry uh, covered some of this. Uh, the only highlight I want to do uh, make on this slide about device and internet and IT is one of the early things we did was create an IT, a separate IT help desk for students and families to access, uh, and that has really uh, been beneficial. It's a dedicated email and phone number just for students and families that goes to every IT worker, and whoever gets it first deals with it. So um, I'll leave this slide at that, and if anybody had any follow-up, they can contact us. And one of our unforeseen successes of the district-wide distance learning was that we became a Google district in 2012. And then, as you can see on the slide, we've uh, trained the majority of our staff in uh, Google Level 1 certification and uh, some in Google Level 2 certification. Um, in addition, this year, uh, our each administrator is managing a Google Classroom for all the teacher evaluation documents, so our entire faculty had a working familiarity with Google Classroom. Um, when we looked to see which learning management platform we should do for uh, the primary grades, uh, we sought out Seesaw only because uh, we had a great number of people who were using the free version. All of this has allowed for teachers to support their colleagues with online learning, which is great for morale and to have teachers within a PLC help each other and it's also helped the IT staff and the technology coaches from being the sole support for this distance learning. We're going to jump into the last section of our presentation is really around our ongoing work. So we just shared some upfront strategies and now uh, some highlights about our ongoing work. And I'll ask uh, Joe Macrino, principal at the elementary, kick us off. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. So um, the, the two strong elements that worked in our favor from the beginning were an established professional network and a guiding document pr uh, provided by Assistant Superintendent Powers. So um, at an administrative level, Tom and Craig have great collaborative networks with other districts. So they were able to take all those um, those other districts and agencies into perspective to provide what was best for our district individually. 
Um, and then Assistant Superintendent Powers created that master document of online learning that really served as our mission statement, our anchor to guide all of our decisions. Holding level as an administrator to other elementary schools. Like Dr. Pascarella said, it's those morning meetings among administration daily plan for the day. And then those afternoon ones saying, well, we have to do this um, next day. So um, it was a couple of weeks of strong fidelity amongst the three elementary schools. And then as we got more comfortable, you know, we respect our, you know, we, we share the similar philosophies, but we're all three different schools. So now that we have that time with fidelity, um, we can proceed to meet the needs of our students and staff. However, every piece of communication from elementary administration is signed by all three admins and it's sent out at the same time. So they, um, everybody knows there's that through line of quality and adherence to a district plan. Um, when we get into engagement, that's always the, the first item of every agenda. And long story short, we can't force the classroom into a living room. And going back to Maslow's hierarchy, we have to prioritize social emotional support. And we have social workers, school psychs, and the classroom teachers identifying through attendance who is logging in and who isn't. And so those are just, check, you know, everybody's assigned a point person. We call those families, we see what the need is, and then we build up in terms of academics. But that that rapport, that collaboration with families have to exist first before we go anywhere else. And ongoing teacher collaboration, I mean, PLCs, we had some great data cycles in place. So the data looks different, but it's still robust. We're using Seesaw and Google Classroom now as student portfolios. So those are the artifacts that will guide decisions when it comes to instruction and planning. And I'm sure you'll all agree there's nothing better than routine in a cloud of chaos. So those faculty meetings have been so important to provide that home where staff can share their struggles and at the same time really share and focus on those celebrations. Well, last week was rough, but look how far you've gotten this week. So what are you going to do next week? And once again, as an administrator, when you're in these meetings, these grade level planning meetings, you have to use that time to take your staff's emotional temperature and do those follow up phone calls afterwards saying, you know what, the next couple of days, why don't you try this? You know, you have my permission to try an alternative or to spread the work so you can get through this week because I know your grandmother is sick or I know you just had twins. So we have to be human as well, and not only check on our kids, but our staff. And just keep those routines of the week weekly faculty meetings and the PLC meetings so we can have some normalcy and we can still provide rigorous instruction. I'm trying to advance it and if somebody knows, there we go. Yeah, so I, I think I could speak on this. Uh, this is Jim Sachs again from Clark Lane. We were really uh, cognizant of level and experience of staff and Mr. Powers uh, and Mr. Giar put together great training and communication to both staff and students and we took it slow as Craig had indicated earlier. Um, we didn't rush this whole process, which was excellent. I mean, there's a couple other things you can read there, but I think what was important in communicating to my staff was to try to explain to them what what we had taken out of the equation when these kids went home. And we tried to explain to them that what we took out was a really important thing was their teaching in a building that was designed for teaching. And once the faculty really understood that that big piece was no longer a part of the students' lives, I think their minds were more creative and they were more at ease in approaching students that were struggling. Um, and I thought, think they also had more appreciation for you know, how much we can do when students are in the building versus what we can do when they're home. And I think it actually made everybody a little bit more at ease. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and there's some things that, you know, individual schools are doing like purposeful downtime at the high school. And, um, but the check-ins like Joe Macrino said, a really important check-in with your staff and check-in with kids. So, uh, teaching and learning solely through distance learning is new for all of us, teachers, students, and parents alike. So it's important to get feedback. We sent out a brief 15 question survey on how we're doing for each family uh, and how each family is faring. And some key takeaways are 91% uh, reported that their child is dedicated to distance learning. 96% of the district's uh, communication is uh, just right. 
and 93% indicated that they had either no tech issues or the tech issues were resolved. Uh, and that overall the distance learning program is going good. Each building received this information and can be broken down uh, to the grade level. Principals have shared that with the grade level and the feedback comments with teachers so uh, they can validate their hard work and determine uh, if any tweaking is needed for the rest of the school year. Our contact information is on the last slide, which you have in the handout section. We're happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thanks very much, Ajit. Sure, thank you, Tom. I'm sorry to have to cut you, but I just have one question. Can you say maybe 30 seconds on a bit more about your purposeful downtime and the Fridays, maybe a couple of examples? Yeah, Craig, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about what our uh, Waterford High Fridays? Yeah, uh, so uh, our high school runs on an AB block. Uh, so the high school faculty uh, give out the uh, work, uh, if it's an A day, uh, for the week, and if it's a B day, for that week. And then uh, because uh, high school uh, has so many uh, students to see, Fridays are spent with teachers uh, convening mini um, Google Classroom uh, uh, or, or Google Meets meetings uh, or Zoom meetings. Uh, with students are able to answer some questions. And so um, basically like two days worth of, uh, two A days worth of work is given out and two B days are given and Fridays is kind of like that check for understanding uh, to ensure that uh, everyone is uh, getting the, the work done and ready for next week. Great, thank you so much. Uh, uh, lots of uh, wonderful information being shared. Um, really appreciated Waterford team. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it to Mark Benigni and the Meriden team. Mark. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share how Meriden Public Schools are making it work and supporting all learners. I'm Mark Benigni in my 10th year as Superintendent of Schools. Joining me today are Patricia Sullivan Kowalski, Senior Director of Student Supports in Special Education. Susan Moore, Supervisor of Blended Learning, and Eric Elias, School Psychologist. Let me share a little about our district. We have 12 schools and four programs that serve over 8,000 students. 75% of our students are students of color, and 77% of our students qualify for free or reduced price meals. However, everyone receives a universal free breakfast and lunch. So let me share with you how we laid the foundation for student success. It all starts with union and community partnerships, and that has not changed in 10 years. We have always had a very forward-thinking Board of Education, and in 2014, they adopted policies to promote a culture of student-centered practices, technology integration, and online learning. Our guiding principle is, regardless of socioeconomic status, or prior learning experiences, all students must be able to access digital resources to expand their world. Our emphasis has always been on providing equity, leveling the playing field, and, and ensuring that all our students have access to Chromebooks and digital content so they are prepared to compete in a global society. Our four core values are, one, we all learn differently. Two, voice and choice matter. Three, learning spaces need to be flexible, and four, anytime, anywhere learning must be embraced. When I came to district 10 years ago, Meriden students were not issued devices. Fast forward 10 years, and we now are a one-to-one -one school district. Though it has never been about the device, it is about high-quality digital content embedded in the curriculum. Hotspots were always available for students to sign out, like a book from the Media Center. However, we have added an additional 75 hotspots to support our students learning at home. With the foundation in place, we launched distance learning. We started on Friday, March 13th. Going the distance to a distance learning environment required us to create a distance learning plan, design memorandums of understanding with our union partners, create work assignments, establish food sites, and communicate with all stakeholders. While students in grades six through 12 had school issued devices, 
we distributed over 3,500 Chromebooks to our K-5 students. We collaborated with our teachers and administrators unions to create clear teacher expectations for distance learning. We have also opened and successfully closed over 150 technology work orders from our students and families. So what does distance learning look like in the Meriden Public Schools? We stay true to our core values. Students learn anytime, anywhere, and embrace flexible learning spaces in their own homes. Because all students learn differently, and we know that voice and choice matter, students access assignments at times that are convenient for them and their families. Also, teachers use multiple tools to connect with their students online. And now I'm going to turn it over to our supervisor of blended learning, Sue Moore, who will share the details of our distance learning plan. Sue. Thank you, Dr. Benigni. The Meriden Public Schools distance learning plan can be found on the district website, meridenk12.org. Our plan was developed to provide all students learning experience that utilize our digital content in addition to core instruction from our teachers at each grade level. In planning for an extended school closure or should a staff member become sick, Meriden Public Schools weekly digital content requirements focus on sustaining and providing personalized and adaptive content for all learners. The district has shared the minimum number of minutes that students should be accessing digital content as part of their core assignments each week. As Dr. Benigni mentioned, Meriden Public Schools has built strong partnerships with digital content providers. While we can't control the level of support a student may have at home or the capacity of every teacher to provide distance learning support, we knew we could leverage existing resources to provide access to core curricular resources in reading and math that both students and teachers were comfortable with. At the elementary level, this includes ELA through 60 minutes a week in Imagine Learning and Mayan, and ST Math for 60 minutes a week. Teachers in kindergarten through grade five are providing lessons in Google Classroom. In grades six through eight, weekly expectations include 30 minutes of writing and grammar instruction with no red ink, 30 minutes of science with legends of learning, and 60 minutes of math using Alex. In addition to using Google Classroom, high school teachers are also using the learning management system Moodle to offer anytime, anywhere access to the curriculum. Once we assessed the digital content that was in place, familiar to students and could be easily accessed, we looked at how to expand the use of existing resources to meet the needs of all learners. Legends of Learning, previously used for middle school science, was extended to grades three through five for 30 minutes of science instruction. Alex was added at the high school level for 60 minutes of math each week. Reading Plus, previously used with a limited number of students, was expanded to both the middle and high school for 60 minutes of reading instruction. No Red Ink was extended to the high schools for 30 minutes a week of writing and grammar instruction. Finally, College Board AP preparation and testing information was quickly shared with students. Outside of the core content areas, our Unified Arts provides an opportunity for students to explore their passions and interests. These are activities that are fun, engaging, and require minimum parental support. At the high school level, these credit earning classes are part of the student's daily schedule. K-8 Unified Arts teachers are posting weekly assignments for their students to complete and to make sure all students and staff can easily access distance learning resources, Meriden uses ClassLink as a single sign-on solution. Whether on a home device or district-issued device, students are able to access digital content through our single sign-on portal. We took a similar approach to supporting teachers, students, and parents. How can we leverage existing resources and what gaps do we need to fill? We already had a help desk system and the staff in place to support teachers. Our technology integration specialist provides tech tips via email, maintains a technology integration website full of resources and frequently provides remote support to teachers and other buildings through Hangouts. Content area coaches in reading and math also support teachers. So where were the gaps? 
Students and parents needed a vehicle to access technology support that would usually be handled at the school level, so we launched remote support. Families can fill out an online form or call. Our IT staff will troubleshoot the issue, and if they cannot fix a Chromebook, Chromebook issue remotely, families can drop off the Chromebook at school and pick up another device so students can continue to work at home. As we implemented distance learning, we worked closely with our teachers union to develop a memorandum of understanding that provides clear teacher expectations. We are supporting teachers at home in multiple ways, including web-based professional development on both digital tools and best practices for distance learning. Coaches are working with teachers supporting digital content, and IT continues to work with teachers remotely, and virtual staff and department meetings are held weekly to address any issues or concerns. To summarize, our tips for success include set clear expectations for students and staff. Our distance learning plan includes minimum participation minutes and guidelines for interacting with students and families. Continue learning for students and your staff. There's no doubt that learning has changed during this time, but by no means should it stop. Both students and staff will need to learn new skills, which is why you need to provide support. Merit and leverage its existing support staff and other teacher leaders, including technology teachers and department leaders, to provide Google Hangout sessions for staff on multiple topics, including Hangouts, Classroom, Forms, Moodle, etc. Our IT department created a help desk system for parents and students experiencing technical difficulties. Stick with what you know. While dozens of vendors have graciously offered to extend free subscriptions to district during this pandemic, there is something comforting in familiarity, especially in times of stress. Start with the programs and tools your staff and students are familiar with. See if there are additional features that can be incorporated into your distance learning plan before adding new tools. And keep it manageable. As Meriden's distance learning plan evolved, we were very aware that students, parents, and staff were feeling overwhelmed with both the quantity of digital learning material and the rapid pace of change. Limiting the number of tools and setting district expectations helped everyone to remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Be flexible. This is not a static plan. We are definitely in a continuous improvement cycle. We plan, we implement, we monitor to see what is working and what isn't and make adjustments as new information becomes available. Even with all of the craziness going on around us, there are great things happening every day. Stop recognize and celebrate those successes. We are so proud of our students, families, and staff for jumping into distance learning and doing the best they can to make it work. And now I'm going to turn it over to our Senior Director of Student Supports and Special Education, Patty Sullivan Kowalski, who will share how Meriden is making it work for students with special needs. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. The Meriden Public Schools Special Education Department initially focused our work in three areas, collaboration, coordination, and communication, in order to best meet the needs of our students. Families were quickly overwhelmed, so having the student teams coordinate services was a must. Ongoing two-way communication with families and staff is essential to this work. Once we established we were able to gather all the critical information and then able to create individualized continued learning plans. We use Google Classroom, Parent Square, Google Hangout to engage families and students. We continue to stay in close communication and we follow current, current state guidance. We utilize Google Hangout as the vehicle to provide direct one-to-one -one related services. Our support personnel have begun to engage in phone and video activities with students. Our students who have a high need for social emotional learning skills, who have had difficulty engaging in the distance learning, or who are identified by the classroom teacher as requiring additional adult support for social emotional needs have been targeted for this service. In addition, our partnership with Gaggle Security Management System has proven to be just as essential in distance learning as it is in traditional settings. 
Gaggle has alerted us of concerns and we have been able to have clinical staff reach out immediately to families and often include emergency services. Our speech language pathologist, physical therapist, and occupational therapist have all provided in-home activities and YouTube videos in the areas of mindfulness, sensory regulation, and self-care to assist families in meeting their children's needs. Many of these activities have recently been highlighted on Edutopia's social media platforms. We continue to focus our attention on assisting the high school seniors during the time of distance learning through connecting them to resources and hosting a webinar series on important next steps for post-secondary plans. I now would like to, to introduce Eric Elias, a Meriden Public Schools school psychologist who will share the district support strategies for social emotional learning. Thank you, Patty. One thing that was clear to us throughout this pandemic was that relationship and relationships and connections are of significant importance to the learning process. We know that learning is cultivated in the relationship between the student and the teacher. Our schools have responded creatively in staying connected with our students and families during the stressful time through a variety of activities such as video messages and car parades. Since we're distanced, we've had to make a more concerted effort to build those relationships that previously happened by default simply because of proximity. One thing that was immensely important to us to recognize is that this is stress for all of us. As educators, not only are we first responders, but we are also affected by the current stress of the situation. These events blend a rich soup of emotions, sensations, urges, and memories, and we need to make room for all of them and move through them. While the four walls of our buildings may have changed, our mission remains to assist students with academic, social, emotional, and personal growth. Focusing on self-care and efforts to build resilience are key to working through and overcoming this adversity. Our first challenge uh, has been to focus on safety, social distancing, and letting students know that we're here for them. Our challenge now, of course, is blending academics as well. While we all have high expectations and high standards, building this road while we're on it, there is no map. So we have to exercise connections over perfection, which we know will benefit all of our students. The concept of Maslow before Bloom is mad in this pandemic. Making sure students' emotional and physical needs are met is first and foremost. We also know that social, emotional, and academic learning are not asynchronous. They can be interwoven. Building social and emotional learning and empathy into our climate and instruction carries over into the supports and services that we're providing all students. Meeting these needs has required a patient but proactive approach. And though we're in uncharted territory, we're designing and planning this process in order to impact positive outcomes. Here's how we're meeting these challenges. Developing resilience and continuing to build upon our practices ensures that we're meeting the social and emotional needs of all stakeholders. And in order to successfully support, we need to focus on the needs of both students and adults across our tiers. First and foremost, here's how our staff is supporting students. Maintaining connections, structure, routines, and scheduling helps to foster a sense of safety and security and positive attachments. As we mentioned, schools are continuing their efforts to stay connected. Some things that we're doing continue to make learning safe and predictable and foster positive uh, and positive our school-wide events such as the video messaging and the car parades that we mentioned earlier. Here's another example of creative connecting. One of our teachers, Mrs. Jensen, sent each of her students a paper cutout of herself along with a handwritten letter. Borrowed from Flat Stanley, she let her students know that she is interested in having them take her on their daily adventures and document their interactions. This creative approach is reassuring to students and reminds them that she is still with them, even though we are distanced. We know that maintaining structure and routines provides a sense of safety and security. Our teachers are continuing to connect creatively by finding new ways to celebrate student successes. 
some students will miss out on the typical celebrations for what might be considered high school rites of passage, student honors, recognitions, proms, graduations, birthday celebrations with friends. Our teachers are continuing to celebrate in new and creative ways, letting students know that they haven't been forgotten and their hard work is recognized. Recognizing these will ease the stress of missed activities. Some further examples of how teachers are remaining connected to students are spirit weeks, birthday recognitions, model citizen celebrations, and engaging students in fun online games. These are all examples of maintaining a positive school climate and ensuring connectedness during these times. Our students have also done a great job supporting and celebrating one another on social media platforms. They're missing each other and the social connectedness that would normally come with seeing each other on a daily basis. We are encouraging these positive connections and building student leadership in this way. In one school, students continued with a virtual rock band performance activity that had been planned prior to the closure. Engaging creatively provides students with an outlet and a sense of purpose. Students are also initiating and maintaining connections through their own daily check-ins and even doing work together on a regular basis. Students are also honoring each other on social media by recognizing college acceptance and post high school work and other activities. This positivity is contagious and builds a sense of control and agency, even in the little things. Last and certainly not least, we as adults need to replenish our wells of energy and compassion, pausing to take care of ourselves. The adage that we must put on our own oxygen masks first before we're able to help others is crucial. As adults, focusing on activities that build resilience, such as healthy habits, optimism, flexible thinking, moving away from negative thinking traps, and moving toward our values will build us up for the work that we're doing and for what is to come upon our return. Maintaining supports through activities such as this self-care video that was created by our lead physical therapist, or mindful moments, or activities that encourage staff to reach out all continue to build our collective sense of community and climate while we're apart. Even remembering to have our own virtual gatherings is important. Like students, we need to maintain our connections with our friends and coworkers, and as adults and caregivers, taking moments to recognize our feelings, reset and recharge can help us have the energy to attend to what is important here and now and to empower us with action. Replenishing our wells also allows us to act based on our values and contribute to larger communities. Sue Moore and her team donated time, materials, and printers to help Yukon Health work towards its goal of 20,000 mask adapters for their frontline staff at Yukon John Dempsey Hospital. This is what happens when we act based on our values. These actions tip the balance toward connectedness, love, and resilience. And this is what drives us and ultimately what will help us build and maintain the resilience that will carry us through post-crisis and proactively. We're building resilience now so that we can move through this together and continue to grow and respond to the current needs, as well as the needs that we know will be there in the future. Meriden Public Schools is responding to this crisis, knowing that together we are braver, stronger, and smarter as a team than any one individual. And now, uh, Mark Benigni. I want to thank the State Department of Education for their leadership during this challenging time and for the opportunity to share how Meriden Public Schools are supporting all learners in a distance learning environment. I also want to thank our friends in Danbury and Waterford for sharing their great work with Meriden. I know how lucky I am to work in a district where everyone works together and truly cares about one another. Our students, staff, families, and community have been amazing. As we all have been challenged to look differently at education, I know we have seen the power of technology and teachers coming together to meet the needs of students. And there is no turning back. I wish all of you the best in your journey. Stay well and thanks again. And thank you, Mark and the Meriden team for an excellent organized uh, uh, presentation. Uh, most appreciated. Uh, I am going to pose a question. I know we're a little bit over, so if uh, folks want to hang with me for just a minute, uh, I do want to pose one question for all three uh, districts, and if you could just give brief responses 
as you know, and, and this came in, it, it, it asks about parents feeling overwhelmed um, and, uh, and stressed with all this uh, complete shift to distance learning where uh, a lot is being expected of parents, especially in the early grades. So I would just like to get brief thoughts from, from you, Mark, uh, and your team to start with, but then maybe you could pass it around to the other two. Uh, just one minute each, please, because we're, we are over time. How are you handling uh, parent feelings of uh, being overwhelmed and stressed, and how are you uh, making them uh, feel part of the overall distance learning program and connecting them back? Sure, I think for us it starts with communication, making sure that they're getting the information they need and the support they need. I think we, when we created our distance learning plan, we really wanted to make sure that some of the, the items embedded in the plan were adaptive so students really could learn at their own level. And we also wanted to make sure that some of the programs and digital content partners that we were using and encouraging and requiring students to use were also able to be utilized by students with corrective action and um, assistance along the way. So I think blending that, keeping parents in the loop and making sure that when new learning was required, teachers would either provide assistance through the Google Hangouts or we'd utilize adaptive programming uh, to challenge students and meet them where they're at. Thank you. Uh, can I switch to Waterford? Sure, G. It's uh, Tom G. Uh, I think uh, building upon what Mark and, and Meriden just said is one of the decisions we made is we didn't want technological issues in the home to be the source of that stress and, and whatnot. So by setting up a separate IT portal just for students and families and that anything that came in through that portal went to every IT worker, that really uh, brought down the stress level in homes. And as Craig, our assistant superintendent mentioned, that was uh, a clear strength for us on our parent survey. Uh, and I think the second thing is doing a parent survey. Uh, principals received that feedback earlier this week and we're tweaking our, our plan again based on that parent feedback. So survey and IT was key for us. Excellent, and uh, Dan Barry? So um, in Danbury, we, you know, we definitely are using surveys um, to get to sort of where the parents are with certain aspects of, of this shift um, and are, you know, meeting to make adjustments um, on a regular basis with that. Um, but also, you know, we have a requirement that um, the teachers are not just reaching out to the students um, for the lessons, but they're required to email the, the teachers on a weekly basis as well. So it's not just, you know, the, on the student end, it's, you know, what is it that the parents need to know to help their child be successful this week? And um, kind of opening the door for that communication is, is very helpful as well. Um, and we are also able to post a lot online in terms of uh, parent tutorials and support. So anything that, that we thought was helpful, um, we did it in multiple languages and we posted it to our website um, and we keep referring folks to there. So, you know, if a parent's walking in the door late from work and, you know, 10 o'clock at night, they're still able to, you know, access the website and find any sort of information in their language that they might need to, to help them, uh, you know, support their student, whether it's a technological issue or other. But, um, you know, each week, you know, presents a new challenge. It, it seems as every time we move forward a little bit, you know, something else surfaces that we need to address. And so it's really just keeping up with that communication in real time and making sure it's available in a language that's accessible to our families. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ultimately, it is about people and it is about relationships. And uh, you three districts, you have shown us um, how to do it right and how you are working on it every day and in a continual fashion. So thank you again. And on behalf of uh, Commissioner Dr. Miguel Cardona, he did put a note in the chat, uh, thanking the three superintendents, uh, Sal, Tom, and Mark, and your respective teams for the work you're doing to support your students and other districts in Connecticut. Greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.